Hello there. Welcome to the webinar today, folks. For those of you who have joined us, um, we're going to start now. The webinar should go roughly for um, 60 minutes and you will have access to the slides um, as um, registered participants. So welcome. Um, we're here today to talk about supporting mental health, neurodiversity, medical conditions and disability at the University of Queensland. We'd like to start by formally acknowledging, um, doing an acknowledgement of country. So the University of Queensland acknowledges the traditional owners and their custodians of the lands on which we meet. We pay our respects to their ancestors and their descendants who continue cultural and spiritual connections to country. We recognise their valuable contributions to Australian and global society. So what are we going to cover today? Okay, we're going to talk about what is disability and mental health? How can you get over the challenges? What kinds of signs might you experience when you need help and you think, hmm, where do I go? Um, why, why do people provide support to people with disabilities? What kinds of support do we provide um, what additional supports does UQ provide? How do we manage your confidential um, information? And a little bit about us. So today um, I'm Aileen and I'm one of the principal student advisors in student services. Um, my other colleagues as principal student advisors include James Yu, Francesca Reddington, Sarah Nest and Tanya Cap. So they're people that you might also work with when you meet with us. I also would like to thank my colleague, Lucy, who's managing the webinar chat. So if you have any questions, feel free to type them in the chat and Lucy and I will do our best to answer them. Okay. And next slide. So studying at uni is really exciting. You know, you're new to a lot of new things. You possibly are living away from home for the first time. You might be in a different country. But we all know that you sometimes can experience um, barriers to doing well with your studies. And, and knowing um, who to go to for support can be a bit confusing. We're a big organisation. So the student advice team, which is part of the group that I work in, we can provide referrals and assistance to you if you have a condition or if you have exceptional circumstances. So if, for example, you know, you went for a horse ride and you fell and you broke your leg or your arm or you had some injury, you couldn't sit your exams, all of those with significant responsibilities for caring for a person with condition. These are the sorts of things that we can help with. So the question is, what is classed as a disability? And the, the definition itself is really, really broad. And um, the University of Queensland um, is guided by the legislation, which is called the Disability Discrimination Act 1992. In Australia, about one in six people have a disability and it can be visible or invisible. So if somebody has a broken arm and they're in a cast it's really easy, easy to see, oh, they've got a broken arm, something's happened. But if somebody is suffering anxiety or depression or they have ADHD and they're just walking down the street, you wouldn't know until you've spoken with them perhaps that there was um, any kind of condition at all. So you can't look at somebody and say, oh, they look all right, they haven't got a disability. 
So the, th the simplest way to think about a disability is it can be physical, mental, intellectually challenging, and it impacts on the way you function. And not everyone who has a disability will identify as having a disability. And it's more about thinking about what impact does it have on how you function? How do you study? How do you prepare for your exams? How do you interact with others? How do you do group work? So sometimes only certain activities will be impacted by the disability. So for example, if somebody has a physical disability that is something that they will get over, so a broken leg, they won't be able to play their usual sport for a period of time. They might need additional support, but eventually that leg hopefully will heal and, and they don't need that support anymore. Other support is more ongoing. So let's talk a little bit about mental health. It's really important. Mental health refers to the way our emotions and our behaviours impact our well-being. So think about times when you were really, really happy. How did you feel? You probably had more energy. You're excited. You might have um, felt like you'd had a lot of coffee. You're, you know, you're smiling. You're talking and so forth. But think about when in the past you've had some emotions that make you feel worried or sad or scared or afraid or not sure about something. You might be introspective. You might be a bit quieter. You might not go out as much. You might not go to social activities as much. And Every now and then, everyone's mental health impacts on their ability to function. So if you've suffered a loss in your family, you've lost a grandparent or a sibling, that's going to impact on how you feel about life, how you feel about yourself, your energy levels. And almost one in two Australians have experienced a mental health condition at some time in their lifetime. And there is research to say that younger Australians, so folks in a lot of your cohort, age 16 to 34, are more likely to experience high levels of psychological distress. That's based on the research. And we've certainly seen the effects of COVID on the generation. And we've seen the impacts on students being quarantined and so forth. And as a principal student advisor, my colleagues and I, about 70% of the group of students that we see, so roughly I think there's 55,000 students uh, at UQ, so about 70% of the students that we see, we support due to their impact of their mental health condition. So things that you probably didn't expect. So let's talk a little bit about stigmas. So if you look at the slide there, there's some statements. I'm going to read out the first statement. I get anxious all the time. We all do. It's just part of normal life. Why do people with anxiety need special adjustments? Question. You're right. Anxiety is a part of normal life. If you're crossing the road and you've got the right of way on a cross road and you have a green light and a car comes flying to a stop, you're going to feel instant anxiety. You're going to feel flight or fight. This car is coming towards me. I'm going to be hit. Perfectly normal. The challenge with anxiety is when it starts to impact your functioning over time. So when you get that flight or fight feeling all the time, it will become disabling. And people will need treatment, whether psychological treatment or drug treatment from their doctors, people will need support with that when the anxiety level becomes constant and chronic. So the next stigma, the next question I'll put to the group. Hmm. hmm, the students work. I can't be really all that bad. So let's think about that. Some conditions can impact people all the time. 
And this means it can reduce functioning all or most of the times. However, there are conditions that fluctuate and are more problematic in certain situations. So for example, if you had social anxiety and you were forced to work all of a sudden with a group of people that you don't know and you have to interact with those people and you already have social anxiety, that may manifest itself or show itself as you being functionally impacted in that situation. But playing sport, doing your own activities, play, meeting with friends that you know, your level of anxiety is and your functional impact is fine. So there's no impact. The next statement is they look fine. There can't be anything wrong with them. And we've covered this already in terms of the physical versus the invisible disabilities. And this is something that people are really, really conscious of, that disability does not equal automatic physical disability. The, the rainbow of spectrum of disability is, is wide and many things are, are not visible to people. And the last statement that is a stigma, well, how will they be able to do their job if they need help with study? This is one that I really enjoy challenging and I really enjoy working with the academics because as a person employed in the organisation, the organisation has a responsibility to ensure that everyone has equal participation. So if I have a colleague who needs a wheelchair and they need a height adjusted desk and they need access and all those sorts of things that that colleague needs because of their disability, what happens? The organisation provides it. So that argument that students are provided with increased support and therefore, how are they possibly going to manage in the workplace is null and void. And it's one that I do enjoy uh, making sure that our students are aware of and academics are aware of. So picture yourself, you're at uni, you're in week four, week five, or you could be week one. These are some of the dot points that you might want to put aside in the back of your mind to think, mm, I might need to get a bit of help here. I might need to get a bit more support for myself. But some of the things could be falling behind, not understanding the context, you go to classes, you go to tutorials, you're not too sure, you don't want to ask the lecturer, you get a bit anxious, oh, you miss the class, it doesn't matter, I don't understand it anyway, and I hate math, so I'm not going to go to the math class, and then you could be really, really struggling at home, you can't sleep, you go to bed, you wake up, you go to class, you're tired all the time at class, what happens? You can't concentrate because you're not sleeping and you're worried and so forth. So I better have a bit of that Red Bull or V or some other kind of energy drink because I've got to, I've got to keep going. So I'll, I'll do that. And that just leads to me feeling more stressed and more anxious. And then I didn't actually attend that class. So I'm not going to do that. I'm just going to put it to one place. And you can, you can see that all of these signs are actually leading to the, the very important fact that you are needing to get some assistance. So I really like this slide, and I don't know whether people have seen this before, but it, it, it's simple, but it's a very important concept. So I'd like you to focus on the slide the image of the slide. So we've got two people, let's say that they're both really, really competent umpires of a tennis match. They both know the rules, they both know the players, they both know what to do, and they arrive to, to provide commentary on the match. So the goal of this activity is to describe the other side, what's going on on the other side of the fence. 
So if both people understand tennis and they know the rules of the game, what does person B, who's the smaller person, need to do? And just going to our next slide, as you can see, by putting in adjustments, person B, who's the smaller person, can participate at an equitable level. They can comment on the tennis match just as well as the person on their left. There is no issue. What did they need? They needed an adjustment. Now, here is a really key part. Adjustments don't give you an advantage. You still have to do the test. You still have to write the assignment. You have no other um, easy pass. And you still have to meet the key assessment objectives and the learning and requirements, the inherent requirements. And obviously, safety needs to be maintained. But if you look at the picture of the two people, you can see that the adjustments who are represented by the verbal box, they provide equal support so that the student who has a disadvantage in any capacity is able to work and study in the same way as the person on the left. I really like that uh, analogy and I will credit my colleague Sarah Nest to, who, who explained that to me when I first saw it and I thought it was a very clever way of explaining um, adjustments. So we will go to our next slide. All right, so the question is, who can access support? Basically, if you're a UQ student and you're enrolled, you can access support, okay? So if you're not certain, if you look at the categories on the screen, hmm, I, think, I think I've got a mental health issue. I'm not sure. Um, it could be a physical sensory issue, hearing vision, all those sorts of things, a chronic health condition, um, students that have chronic pain, students that have uh, chronic sporting injuries, those sorts of things. If you're undertaking a carer's role, and, and I will stress that the carer here is not a carer for a child, unless the child or the parent or the human that you are caring for has a, a significant physical or mental condition. We sometimes get very, very, very busy mums and dads who are new parents and they say, oh, I'm a carer, I, I can have that support. It's not support in that particular way. It's about a formal carer's role. Now, you'll notice there, we also provide support for students who are in the defence force or who are registered as elite athletes. So, for example, students who are registered as elite athletes participate perhaps in international or national competitions. They might be overseas training. They might be preparing for the Olympics. So these are the sorts of things that we provide support for. And I will say that supporting documentation is needed to have adjustments in place. And that might be a letter from your doctor or psychologist or treating health professional. So. What kind of support do we provide? I'd like to take a little bit of your time to talk about two words that you probably hear quite a lot in this space and that's SAP which stands for student access plan and EA which are exam adjustments. Now I'll talk about the other three things as well but a lot of our students have either a student access plan and an exam plan or one or both and the difference is that sometimes the functional impacts are for one type of assessment. So some students have difficulties in the classroom, which is covered by a student access plan. And other students have difficulties with exams due to their disability. So that might be an exam adjustment. So examples 
that we provide are if, for example, a student um, is in the classroom situation and they need an adjustment for how they're sitting in the class, what they need in the class. So I've had students who need to formally leave the class if they're feeling anxious to use their self-soothing strategies or a student might need to stand up and down um, frequently due to stand and stretch requirements or they might need assistance with just a few more days of time before submitting an assignment, a student access plan will do that. You still have to apply for exam extensions with a student access plan, but you won't have to deal with going to the doctor each time you, you need those extensions. Now, exam adjustments very topical at the moment because we're just going into the supplementary exam period so we've we've had one round already so this this is where you need additional support for the exam time and where a student might benefit as opposed to a student who doesn't actually have any anxiety are things like extra time so we meet with you and we create a student access plan and or an exam plan and that goes to the exams team and the student access plan goes to the course coordinators. I will take a moment here to explain that your medical information does not go to the exams team nor to the course coordinators. That remains locked in the confidential section of your student records, but it is required in order to set up a student access plan. So that's a conversation that you'll have with someone like myself or one of my colleagues. Now, the other three things that we also support students with are obviously the physical um, support. So scooters, mobility scooters, we have lo those alone for short or long-term periods. We also work with the university library. We have assistive technology rooms. So these are specialist environments. So areas perhaps with low sensory lighting or other additional support such as Dragon software use for text to speech, braille services and so forth. We work with our wonderful library colleagues. So those sorts of things are available. And of course, there are other things that we can refer you to. You know, we work very closely with our colleagues um, in counselling. So we certainly will liaise and refer um, students to that service. So we also sometimes need to liaise with academic and teaching staff about adjustments and so forth. And we also have services such as specialist equipment loans, laptops and those sorts of things for students with disabilities. So that, as you can see, there is a wide range of um, support that we can provide. So this is a quick graph to sort of show you, you know, what actually happens. So we'll start at the beginning. You'll make an appointment to meet with a member of the student advice team. Um, the team meets um, students Mondays to Fridays. And if you're a Gatton student, we also offer outside hours consultations during the week. So you can access those. So you'll meet with a member of the student advice team. And the first thing I do with my students is I talk about what is the situation, what's happening for you, and what's the functional impact of your health condition. And it's very personal because it's the functional impact on you. So somebody with a mental health condition of anxiety might not need a student access plan. Somebody else might need a student access plan and have adjustments. It's a very personal approach. So what we do is, as student advisors, we draft the assessments and the adjustments for you. And we talk about other supports. So if, for example, there is an opportunity for you to have an alternative form of assessment due to a disability. Do you need extra time? Do you need um, special things brought into exam rooms, et cetera? And that document sits at, on the system and it's submitted um, to the teaching staff. So your course coordinators get a copy of your plan. Now, obviously, you get a copy of your plan too. It is your plan. You own your plan. Um, 
And we we adjust and review that as, as needs be. So most student access plans go from semester to semester and uh, most exam plans go for 12 months. So that's how that basically operates. So just a quick note about confidentiality and disclosure, and this is really important because you are not required to disclose to the university, to myself, to any individual or any institution that you have a disability. If you do disclose that, it is your decision as to how this is shared and with whom. So this is why we talk about functional impacts. So for example, in meeting a student today who's undergoing chemotherapy for cancer treatment, one of the functional impacts for them involves extreme fatigue and the need to actually take frequent breaks from their class. Now I have another student who is currently experiencing a difficult pregnancy and her functional impacts are, she needs to have frequent breaks and she experiences fatigue. So both students have very, very different situations, very different health situations, but their plan will actually talk about the functional impact, not the diagnosis, not the health condition itself. While you need to disclose the condition to us as student advisors, we need to know so we can put this plan in place and put all the supports in place. You are not um, required to disclose this to your teaching staff. And just as I've said earlier, teaching staff do not have access to your medical documentation. The other point I will mention, and different countries do things differently. So in Australia, the support you receive from student services, if you have a student access plan, an exam plan, any of those sorts of things, it's completely separate from any kind of academic record once you graduate. Now, I do understand that we have students from all around the world, and that is different in every country. So sometimes you will hear students say, oh, um, I wouldn't get an access plan because it's going to appear on the transcript. It does not appear on any documentation once you graduate. So I just wanted to stress that to, to you all. So we've covered a lot and you've been, uh, been very patient there. So additional supports that student services provide. Um, all UQ students are entitled to 10 free confidential sessions with our UQ counselling team. They're an amazing group of people. They're very dedicated. And you can go on the website and select an advisor or counsellor to meet with. And they all have a little bit of biography about them. So you can think, oh, that person sounds like they like animals or, you know, I can, I can relate to them. You can select your advisor if you like. Um, you don't need a formal referral or a diagnosis. Sometimes we meet students first and they've never contacted student services before. And we, we would strongly recommend um, that you contact counsellors counselling, but we will talk to our counselling colleagues and say, you know, we've met this person and they're going to put in um, a request for an appointment. So we work very closely with them. The, the other group of really important people to know is learning advisors. Now, I want you to put that in your brains, learning advisors. Learning advisors are the most wonderful group of people who are all dedicated to help you provide free one-on-one -on -one assignment assistance, breaking down tasks. How do you write your, your assignments? How do you understand tasks? Now, I just need to make it very clear. They will not write your assignment for you, nor do your work for you, but they will help you work out strategies. So if you have a particular disability and you have perhaps a neurodiverse perspective, you will find that working with a learning advisor, they will give you the most amazing support and help and tips to assist you with your university life. You know, how do you take notes? How do you avoid pr procrastination? You know, there's also some wonderful uh 
um, self-paced workshops that you can do in that space. So learning advisors, don't forget that one. The other source of support that as potentially new students is the UQ Union. They are an independent group. They're there based on your peers, elected representatives, students who are there to support you. And if you go onto their website, you can see the sorts of things that they provide. And we work really closely with our colleagues there. They particularly provide support in the area of legal services, visa chats, et cetera, all of those sorts of things. And again, free and confidential to students. And if you are identifying as a person that perhaps needs some additional support, there's a wonderful group that the UQ Union organised called the UQU Disability Collective. And they're a group of students who identify that they've got mental health issues, neurodiverse issues, vision, they might have chronic illness and so forth. And they're a good group to network in and they know how UQ works. Often they've been perhaps here for a few years. They know um, the system. They know, you know, what supports you might need. So, again, highly recommend you look at those particular um, two groups. Um, it's just a quick note to mention UQ security here. And you'd be thinking, I'm here because I'm talking about disability. Why do I want to talk about security? Well, let's say you have a condition that requires specific medical care. So I'm going to use epilepsy as an example. One of the things that we would do is that we would suggest that in the event of an emergency and you have a particular health condition that might require security to call an ambulance, you register a medical plan with UQ Emergency Services so that they know what you need. So a plan that I conducted recently with the student with epilepsy was that the student did not want to be touched by a male security officer. The student specifically asked that they be escorted by a female officer and taken you know, gently and supported um, by a female member of staff. Totally their, their right. So it's important to just think about that, but if you've got any questions, that's something that you'd work out with us. Now, it goes without saying, of course, but the UQ Library, has a huge number of resources specifically dedicated to support students around software and all those sorts of things to enable inclusive learning. And the other thing that sometimes students are a bit surprised to learn is that we actually do have a health clinic on site, um, on the St Lucia site. So if for those of you on the Gatton site, you certainly can access the inter-campus bus to make those appointments. And you can access GPs, allied health staff and specialists like psychiatrists and so forth. So um, that is, you know, also an excellent excellent resource. So how do you make appointments? It's best to book online. Um, you can have a short appointment or a long appointment. If you are meeting for the first time and you are bringing your documentation and so forth, we highly recommend that you bring um, all of the paperwork with you and you book in a long appointment, which is a 50 minute appointment, because we will need to go through all of the paperwork, talk about the functional impacts and do those things that we covered um, in, in that graph earlier. Um, you can also go to Student Central uh, in 42, and there are a group of people there who are more than willing to help you with um, short-term questions and things that can perhaps be answered uh, quickly for you. So 
So here's a link and a visual um, slide of the building 42. If you haven't yet seen it in Student Central, do go and have a look at it. You can also use it as a bit of a hangout space. Um, there's Wi-Fi. There's also microwave, tea and coffee facilities. It'll be air conditioned and heated. Um, so the temperature is nice. There's also a Zen zone in there that you can sit and relax in. And that's the building where um, when we meet you on campus, that's the building that we meet on. So there's some links there if you are interested to take those down or take a photo or access the slides. But basically, our email is student.services.uq.edu.au and it's a Monday to Friday service. Um, there is an after hours emergency service, but all those details are on the website and services are free and confidential. So you don't need to worry about um, payment. Well, that brings us to a close. So thank you very much for um, staying with us. I will now just check in with my colleague, Lucy, and see if we have any questions. Lucy, how are we going with questions? No questions so far, Aileen. Um, if anybody has any questions now, please feel free to pop them in the chat and we'll do our best to answer them for you. Hopefully that's been helpful. Um, those of you who have joined, um, we've we really are there to support students. And if you've attended and you perhaps think, oh, I have a friend that might need this information, feel free to share um, this with them and um, direct them to student services. Okay. Well, thank you very much. Uh, we will now end this webinar. All the best for your studies. Well, thank you. Bye-bye. Hi, Claire, are you still here? Um, so just to answer your question about finding out what can be done for HDR students before you provide your documentation. If you just wanna have a quick chat with a student advisor, you can either book a shorter appointment via Student Hub, um, just as a way to work out what might be possible for you before you actually set up a student access plan. Or if you like, you can send an email to the student advice team um, and their email address is ddi as in the letters standing for disability diversity and inclusion so ddi.advisors advisors at uq.edu.au and hi hi nicolette um, with the scooters, that would be organised as part of your student access plan. So you would still need to meet with a student advisor to organise scooter hire. So it would still involve um, booking an appointment and bringing along your documentation. Thanks for everyone for attending today. If you have any further questions, you can always contact us at student.services at uq.edu.au. Thank you. Enjoy the rest of your day.